Hey folks. So I was planning to read A Circle in the Fire, which is a um, really wonderful O'Connor story that has a great exhibit of her sharp wit and um, biting social criticism and um, her almost perfect eye for memorable care drawing memorable character characters um but i started reading it in fact i recorded the whole the whole thing and it uh, ran long so um i kind of uh switched gears and found this other little story that i uh that absolutely charms me uh every time i read it um uh, it's more of a tall tale and uh, maybe a coming of age story and a wonderful example of, um, of O'Connor's ability to uh, write stream of consciousness um, passages. Uh, so it's a little, um, since it is in the stream of consciousness style, um, um, there's some <laughs> rather long passages here. So I'm going to get through them as best I can, but I think it's just a, a, a story that tickles me to death. I hope you enjoy it. It's uh, called The Turkey. His guns glinted sun steel in the ribs of the tree, and half aloud through a crack in his mouth, he growled, All right, Mason, this is far as you go. The jig's up. The six shooters in Mason's belt stuck out like waiting rattlers, but he flipped them into the air, and when they fell at his feet, kicked them behind him like so many tried steer skulls. You varmint, he muttered, drawing a rope tied around the captured man's ankles. This is the last rustling you'll do. He took three steps backward and leveled one gun to his eye. Okay, he said with a cold, slow precision. This is... And then he saw it, just moving slightly through the bushes further over. A touch of bronze and a rustle, and then, through another gap in the leaves, his eyes set in red folds that covered the head and hung down along the neck, trembling slightly. He stood perfectly still, and the turkey took another step, then stopped. One foot lifted, and listen. If he only had a gun, if he only had a gun, he could level aim and shoot it at right where it was. In a second, it would slide through the bushes and be up in a tree before he could tell which direction it had gone in. Without moving his head, he strained his eyes to the ground to see if there were a stone near. The ground looked as if it might just have been swept. The turkey moved again. The foot that had been poised halfway up went down, and the wing dropped over it spreading so that Ruler could see the long, single feathers pointed at the end. He wondered if he dived into the bush on top of it. It moved again, and the wing came up again, and it went down. It's limping, he thought quickly. He moved a little nearer, trying to make his motion imperceptible. Suddenly, his head pierced out of the bush. He was about ten feet from it, and drew back, and then abruptly back into the brush. He began edging nearer with his arms rigid, and his fingers ready to clutch. It was lame, he could tell. He might not be able to fly. He'd shoot his head out once more and saw him and shuttled back into the bushes and out again on the other side. His motion was half lopsided and the left wing was dragging. He was going to get it. He was going to get it if he had to chase it out of the county. He crawled through the brush and saw it about 20 feet away, watching him warily, moving its neck up and down. It stooped and tried to spread its wings and stooped again and went a little way to the side and stooped again trying to make itself go up. But, he could tell, it couldn't fly. He was going to have it. He was going to have it if he had to run it out of the state. He saw himself going in front of the door with it slung over his shoulder and them all screaming, Look at Ruler with that wild turkey! Ruler! Where'd you get that wild turkey? Or, oh, he had caught it in the woods. He thought they might like to have him catch them one. You crazy bird, he muttered. You can't fly. I've already got you. He was walking in a wide circle, trying to get behind it. For a second, he almost thought he could go and pick it up. It had dropped down, and one foot was sprawled, but when he got near enough to pounce, it shot off in a heavy speed that made him start. He tore after it, straight out in the open for half an acre of dead cotton. Then it went under a fence into some woods again, and he had to get on his hands and knees to get up under the fence, but still keep his eye on the turkey, but not tear its shirt. Then after it again, and his head a little dizzy, but faster to catch up with it. He lost it in the woods. It'd be lost for good. It was going to the bushes on the other side. It would go on out in the road. He was going to have to have it. 
He saw it dart through a thicket, and he headed for the thicket, and when he got there, it darted out again, and in a second, it disappeared under a hedge. He went through the hedge fast as he heard his shirt rip and felt cool streaks on his arms where he were getting scratched. He stopped a second and looked down at his torn shirt sleeves, but the turkey was only a little ahead of him. He could see it go over the edge of the hill and down again into the open space, and he darted on. If he came in with the turkey, they wouldn't pay any attention to his shirt. Hain had never got a turkey. Hain had never caught anything. He guessed they'd be knocked out when they saw him. He guessed they'd talk about it in bed. That's what they did about him and Hain. Hain didn't know. He never woke up. Ruler woke up every night except at the time they started talking. He and Hain slept in the room and their mother and father in the next and the door was left open between them every night. And every night, Ruler listened. His father would say finally, how the boys doing? And their mother would say, Lord, they're wearing her to a frazzle. Lord, she guessed they shouldn't worry about. How could she help worrying about Hain the way he was now? Hain had always been an unusual boy, she said. She said he would grow up to be an unusual man, too. And their father would say, yes. If he didn't put in the penitentiary first. And their mother would say, how could he talk that way? And they argued just like Ruler and Hain. And sometimes Ruler couldn't get back to sleep after thinking. He always felt tired when he got through listening, but he woke up every night and listened just the same, and whenever they started talking about him, he sat up in bed so he could hear him better. Once, his father asked why Ruler played himself so, played by himself so much, and his mother said, how was it that she would to know? If he wanted to play by himself, she didn't see any reason he shouldn't, and his father said that worried him, and she said, well, if that was all he had to worry about, he'd do well to stop. Someone told her, she said, that they'd seen Hain at the Ever Ready. And they told him he couldn't go there. His father asked Ruler the next day what he'd been doing lately. And Ruler said, playing by himself and walked off sort of like he had a limp. He guessed his father looked pretty worried. He guessed he'd think it was something when he came home with the turkey slum over his shoulder. The turkey was heading out into the road and for a gutter along the side of it. It ran along the gutter and Ruler was gaining on it all the time until he fell over a root sticking up and spilled the things out of his pockets and had to snatch them up. When he got up, it was out of sight. Bill, you take a posse and go down South Canyon. Joe, you cut around by the gorge and head him off, he shouted to his men. I'll follow him this way. And he dashed off again along the ditch. The turkey was in the ditch, not 30 feet from him, lying almost on its neck, panting. He was nearly a yard from it before it darted off again. He chased it straight until the ditch ended and went out to the road and slid under the hedge on the other side. He had to stop at the hedge and catch his breath, and he could see the turkey on the other side through the leaves, lying on its neck, its whole body moving up and down with his panting. He could see the tip of its tongue going up and down in its open bill. If he could stick his arm through, he might could get it while it was still too tired to move. He pushed up closer to the hedge, eased his hand through, and then gripped it quickly around the turkey's tail. There was no movement on the other side. Maybe the turkey had dropped dead. He put his face close to the leaves to look through. He pushed the twigs aside with one hand, but they would not stay. He let go of the turkey and pulled his other hand through to hold them. Through the hole he had made, he saw the bird wobbling off drunkenly. He ran back to where the hedge began and got on the other side. He would get it yet. Didn't think it was so smart, he muttered. It zigged across the middle of the field and toward the woods again. Couldn't go into the woods. He'd never get it. He dashed behind it, keeping his eyes sharp on it until suddenly something hit his chest and knocked his breath black out of him. He fell back on the ground and forgot the turkey for the cut in his chest. He lay there for a while with things rocking on either side of him. Finally, he sat up. He was facing the tree he had run into. He rubbed his hands over his face and arms and long scratches began to sting. He would have taken it and slugged it over his shoulder and they would have jumped up and yelled, Good Lord, look at Ruler, Ruler, where'd you get that wild turkey? And his father would have said, Man, that's a bird if I ever saw one kicked a stone away from his foot. He'd never see the turkey now. He wondered why he had seen it in the first place if he wasn't going to be able to get it. It was like somebody had played a dirty trick on him. All that running for nothing. He sat there looking sullenly at his white ankles sticking out of his trouser legs and into his shoes. Nuts, he muttered. He turned over on his stomach and let his cheek rest against the ground, dirty or not. He torn his shirt and scratched his arms and got a knot in his forehead. He could feel it rising just a little. It's going to be a big one, all right. All for nothing. The ground was cool to his face, but the grit bruised it. And he had to turn over. Oh, hell, he thought. 
Oh, hell, he said cautiously. Then in a minute, he said just, Hell. Then he said it like Hain said it, pulling the e all out and trying to get the look in his eye that Hain got. Once Hain said, said, God, and his mother stomped after him and said, I won't hear you say that again. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. Do you hear me? And he guessed that shut Hain up. Ha, he guessed she dressed him off that time. God, he said. He looked studiedly at the ground, making circles in the dust with his finger. God, he repeated. God damn it, he said softly. He could feel his face getting hot and his chest thumping all of a sudden inside. God damn it to hell, he said almost inaudibly. He looked over his shoulder. No one was there. God damn it to hell, good Lord from Jerusalem, he said. His uncle said, good Lord from Jerusalem. Good father, good God, sweep the chickens out the yard, he said, and began to giggle. His face was very red. He sat up and looked at his white ankles sticking out of his pants legs into his shoes. They looked like they didn't belong to him. He gripped a hand around each ankle and bent his knees up and rested his chin on one knee. Our father who art in heaven, shoot him six and roll him seven, he said, giggling again. Boy, she'd smack his head in if she could hear him. God damn it, she'd smack his goddamn head in. He rolled over in a fit of laughter. God damn, she'd dress him off and wring his goddamn leg like a goddamn chicken. The laughing cut his side and he tried to hold it in, but every time he thought of his goddamn neck, he shook again. He lay back on the ground, weak with laughter, not able to think of her smacking his goddamn head in. He said the words over and over to himself, and after a while he stopped laughing. He said them again, but the laughing had gone out. He said them again, but it wouldn't start back up. All that chasing for nothing, he thought again. Might as well go home. What do you want to be sitting around here for? He felt suddenly like he would if people had been laughing at him. Ah, go to hell, he told him. He got up and kicked his foot sharply into somebody's leg and said, Take that, sucker. Turn into the woods to take the short trail home. As soon as he got to the door, they would holler, How'd you tear your clothes and where'd you get that knot on your forehead? He was going to say he fell in a hole. What difference would it make? Yeah, God, what difference would it make? He almost stopped. He never heard himself think that tone before. He wondered, should he take the thought back? He guessed it was pretty bad, but heck, it was the way he felt. He couldn't help feeling that way. Heck, hell, it was the way he felt. He guessed he couldn't help that. He walked on a little way thinking and thinking about it. He wondered suddenly if you're going bad. That's what Hain had done. Hain played pool and smoked cigarettes and sneaked in at 12.30 and, boy, he thought he was something. There's nothing you can do about it, her grandmother had told her father. He's at that age. What age? Ruder wondered. I'm 11, he thought. That's pretty young. Hain hadn't started until he was 15. I guess it's worse than me, he thought. He wondered would he fight it. Their grandmother had talked to Hain and told him the only way to conquer devil was to fight him. If he didn't, he couldn't be her boy anymore. Ruder sat down on a stump. And she said she'd give him one more chance. Didn't he want it? And he yelled at her, No! And she'd leave him alone. And she told him, Well, she loved him, even if he didn't love her, and he was her boy anyway, and so was Ruler. Oh, no, I ain't, Ruler thought quickly. Oh, no, she's not pinning any of that stuff on me. Boy, he could shock the pants off of her. He could make her teeth fall in her soup. He started giggling. The next time she asked him if he wanted to play a game of Parcheesi, he'd say, Hell no, God damn it! didn't she know any good games? Go and get her goddamn cards and he'd show her a few. He rolled over on the ground choking with laughter. Let's have some booze, kid, he'd say. Let's get stinky. Boy, he'd knock her out of her socks. He sat on the ground red and grinning at himself, bursting every now and then into a fresh spasm of giggles. He remembered the minister said to a young man, they are going to the devil by the dozens this day and age, forsaken gentle ways, walking the tracks of Satan. They'd rue the day, he said. There'd be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Weeping, Ruler murmured. Men didn't weep. How'd he gnash her teeth, he wondered. He grated his jaws together and made an ugly face. Did it several times. He bet he could steal. He thought about chasing the turkey for nothing. It was a dirty trick. He bet he could be a jewel thief. They were smart. He bet he could have all Scotland Yard at his tail. Hell. He got up. God could go around sticking things in your face and making you chase him all afternoon for nothing. You shouldn't think that way about God, though. 
but that was the way he felt. If that was the way he felt, could he help it? He looked around quickly as if somebody might be hiding in the bushes, and suddenly he started. He was rolled over at the edge of the thicket, a pile of ruffled bronze with a red head lying limp along the ground. Ruder stared at it, unable to think. Then he leaned forward suspiciously. He wasn't going to touch it. Why was it there now for him to take? He wasn't going to touch it. He could just lie there. The picture of himself walking in the room with his slung over his shoulder come back to him. Look at Ruler with the turkey. Lord, look at Ruler. He squatted down beside it and looked without touching it. He wondered what had been wrong with its wing. He lifted it up by the tip and looked under. The feathers were blood-soaked. It had been shot. Must weigh ten pounds, he figured. Lord, Ruler, it's a huge turkey. He wondered how it would feel slung over his shoulder. Maybe, he considered, he was supposed to take it. Rula gets our turkeys for us. Rula got it in the woods, chased it dead. Yes, he's a very unusual child. Ruler wondered suddenly if he were an unusual child. It came down on him in an instant. He was an unusual child. He reckoned he was more unusual than Hain. He had to worry more than Hain because he knew more how things were. Sometimes when he was lifting it, listening at night, he heard them arguing like they were going to kill each other. And the next day, his father would go out early and his mother would have the blue veins out on her forehead and looked like she was expecting a snake to jump from the ceiling any minute. He guessed he was the one most unusual child, children ever. Maybe that was why the turkey was there. He rubbed his hand along his neck. Maybe it was to keep him from going bad. Maybe God wanted to keep him from that. Maybe God had knocked it right there where he'd see it when he got up. Maybe God was in the bush now, waiting for him to make up his mind. Ruler blushed. He wondered if God could think he was a very unusual child. He must. He found himself suddenly blushing and gritting, and rubbed his hand over his face quick to make himself stop. If you want me to take it, he said, I'll be glad to. Maybe finding the turkey was a sign. Maybe God wanted him to be a preacher. He thought of being Crosby and Spencer Tracy. He might found a place for boys to stay who were going bad. He lifted the turkey up. It was heavy, all right. Fitted it over his shoulder. He wished he could see how he looked with that slung over like that. It occurred to him that he might as well go home the long way, through town. He had plenty of time. He started off slowly, shifting the turkey until it fit comfortably over his shoulder. He remembered the things he had thought before he found the turkey. They were pretty bad, he guessed. He guessed God had stopped him before it was too late. He should be very thankful. Thank you, he said. Come on, boys, he said. We'll take this turkey back for our dinner. We certainly are much obliged to you, he said to God. This turkey weighs ten pounds. You're mighty generous. That's okay, God said. And listen, we ought to have a talk about these boys. They're entirely in your hands, see. I'm leaving the job strictly up to you. I have confidence in you, McFarney. You can trust me, ruler said. I'll come through with the goods. He went into town with the turkey over his shoulder, he wanted to do something for God, but he didn't know what he could do. If anybody was playing the accordion on the street today, he'd give them his dime. He only had one dime, but he'd give it to him. Maybe he could think of something better, though. He'd been going to keep the dime for something. He might could do another one from his grandmother. How about a goddamn dime, kid? He pulled his mouth piously out for a grin. He wasn't going to think that way anymore. He couldn't get a dime from her anyway. His mother was going to whip him if he asked his grandmother for more money again. Maybe something would turn up that he could do. If God wanted him to do something, he'd turn something up. He was getting into business block, and through the corner of his eye, he noticed people looking at him. There were 8,000 people in Mulrose County, and on Saturday, every one of them was in Tilford on the business block. They turned as ruler passed and looked at him. He glanced at himself, reflected in the store window, shifted the turkey slightly, and walked quickly ahead. He heard someone call, but he walked on, pretending he was deaf. This is his mother's friend, Alice Gillard. And if she wanted him, let her catch up with him. Ruler, she cried. My goodness, where'd you get that turkey? She came up behind him fast and put her hand on his shoulder. That's some bird, she said. You must be a good shot. I didn't shoot it, Ruler said coldly. I captured it. I chased it dead. Heavens, she said. You wouldn't capture me one sometimes, would you? I might if I ever have time, Ruler said. She thought she was so cute. Two men came over and whistled at the turkey. They yelled at some other men at the corner to look. Another of his mother's friends stopped, and some country boys who had been sitting on the curb got up and tried to see the turkey without showing they were interested. 
A man with a hunting suit and gun stopped and looked at Ruler and walked around behind him and looked at the turkey. How much do you think it weighs? the lady asked. At least ten pounds, Ruler said. How long did you chase it? About an hour, Ruler said. The goddamn imp, the man said in the hunting suit. That's really amazing, the lady com commented. About that long, Ruler said. You must be very tired. No, Ruler said. I have to go. I'm in a hurry. He worked his face to look as if he were thinking something out and hurried down the street until he was out of their view. He felt warm all over, nice as if something very fine was going to be or had been. He looked back once and saw the country boys were following him. He hoped they would come up and ask to look at the turkey. God must be wonderful, he felt suddenly. He wanted to do something for God. He hadn't seen anyone playing the accordion, though, or selling pencils, and he has passed the business block. He might see one before he really got to the streets where people lived at. If he did, he'd give away the dime, even while he knew he couldn't get another one at any time. He began to wish he could see somebody begging. Those country kids were still trailing along behind him. He thought he might stop and ask them, did they want to see the turkey? But they might just stare at him. They're tennis children. Sometimes tennis children just stare at you. He might find a home for tennis children. He thought about going back to town to see if he had passed a beggar without seeing him, but he decided people might think he was showing off with the turkey. Lord, send me a beggar, he prayed suddenly. Send me one before I get home. He had never thought before of praying on his own, but it's a good idea. God had put the turkey there. He had sent him a beggar, right? He knew for a fact God would send him one. He was on Hill Street now. There was nothing but houses on Hill Street. It'd be strange to find a beggar there. The sidewalks are empty except for a few children and some tricycles. Ruler looked back. The country boys were still following him. He decided to slow down. It may make them catch up with him. It might give a beggar more time to get him. If one were coming. He wondered if one were coming. If one came, it would mean God had gone out of his way to get one. It'd mean God was really interested. He had a sudden fear one would wouldn't come. It was a whole fear quick. One will come, he told himself. God was interested in him because he was a very unusual child. He went on. The streets were deserted now. He guessed one wouldn't come. Maybe God didn't have confidence in. No, God did. Lord, please send me a beggar, he implored. He squinched his face rigid and strained his muscles in a knot and said, please, one right now. And then he said it. The minute. Hetty Gilman turned around the corner before him, heading straight to where he was. He felt almost like he had when he ran into the tree. She was walking down the street right toward him. It was just like the turkey lying there. It was just as if she had been hiding behind the house until he came by. She was an old woman whom everybody had said more money than anybody in town because she'd been begging for 20 years. She sneaked into the people's houses and sat until they gave her something. If they didn't, she cursed them. Nevertheless, she was a beggar. Ruler walked faster. He took the dime out of his pocket so he'd be ready. His heart was stomping up and down in his chest. He made a noise to see if he could talk. As they neared each other, he stuck out his hand. Here, he shouted, here. She was tall, long-faced old woman with an antique black cloak. Her face was the color of dead chicken skin. When she saw him, she looked as if she suddenly smelled something bad. He darted at her, thrust a dime into her hand, and dashed on without looking back. Slowly, his heart calmed, and he began to feel full of a new feeling, like being happy and embarrassed at the same time. Maybe, he thought, blushing, he'd give all his money to her. He felt as if the ground did not need to be under him any longer. He noticed suddenly that the country boy's feet were shuffling just behind him, and almost without thinking, he turned and asked graciously, Y'all want to see this turkey? They stopped where they were and stared at him. One in front spit. Ruler looked down quickly. There was real tobacco juice in it. Where'd you get that turkey? The spitter asked. Found it in the woods, Ruler said. I chased it dead. See? It's been shot under the wing. He took the turkey off his shoulder and held it down where they could see. I think it was shot twice, he went on excitedly, pulling the wing up. Let me see it here, the spitter said. Ruler handed him the turkey. You see down there where the bullet hole is, he asked? Well, I think it was shot twice in the same hole. I think it was... The turkey's head flew in his face, and the spitter slung it up in the air and over his own shoulder and turned. The others turned with him, and together they sauntered off in the direction they had come, the turkey sticking stiff out on the spitter's back and his head swinging slowly in a circle as he walked away. They were in the next block before Ruler moved. Finally, he realized that he could not even see them any longer. They were so far away. He turned toward home, almost creeping. He walked four blocks, 
and then suddenly, noticing that it was dark, he began to run. He ran faster and faster, and as he turned up the road to his house, his heart was running as fast as his legs, and he was certain that something awful was tearing behind him with its arms rigid and its fingers ready to clutch. So, um, yeah, fun little, uh, fun little story. Um, I hope you guys enjoyed it, uh, and, um, keep yourselves safe and we'll look for seeing you out there, uh, in the coming months, hopefully, once we, uh, get past, uh, COVID world. Bye now.